Hi kids, welcome back to the foundation courses with us here at Yup Master. In our last lecture, we learned about the excretory system, right? And we also learned about the uh, parts of the nephron, if you remember. We had done about the glomerulus and the renal tubule. Do you all recollect those lectures? Yes. So today, let's go on. We studied in, uh, we're going to be studying about the internal structure of the nephron. And we will also be beginning with the uh, urine formation process. All right. Okay, so uh, good evening. Uh, your name is Bhavya, right? Good evening, Bhavya. So shall we begin? All right. Okay, so be, uh, before we begin anything else, we start with the basic blood supply of the nephron. Okay, now for any given organ, if you see in our body, okay, there is basically going to be a network of blood vessels, which is carrying oxygenated blood to that organ. The organ will utilize that oxygen and the organ will give out the carbon dioxide which will be taken away by the veins, right? Okay, so now what we see is, let's see what is happening in the case of the nephron, in the case of the kidney, okay? Let us see how the blood supply is and the reason I'm telling you that is because there's going to be a little difference over here, okay? So let's mark it where the difference is, all right? So here it is, this is the nephron, right? And in this nephron, like I had explained to you last time, remember? When you're talking about the excretory system, okay, there is a aorta, the largest blood vessel aorta and a branch of the aorta is the renal artery, right? Okay, so it is the renal artery which can be found inside the kidney because it is supplying the kidney. Do you think that the aorta would be found inside the kidney? Not at all. If it is in the kidney, it is the renal artery, okay? Now, since this here is a diagram of a nephron, so this is a structure which is inside the kidney and this blood vessel over here is also found inside the kidney and this is nothing but the renal artery. So this is going to be the renal artery. All right. So here is the renal artery. Now, these are all going to be new terms for you. Okay. So do pay attention. The renal artery is going to divide. Okay. It's going to form bifurcations and artery always divides becomes thinner and arteries become thinner to form structures which are going to be called as arterioles okay these are structures called as arterioles so arteries divide to become arterioles all right now they are called as this is called as first an efferent arteriole understand the meaning of the word efferent efferent always means something which is going towards a particular part so, if you remember, what is the name of this region here? What was that whole bunch of capillaries? Didn't we call that as the glomerulus? So, this is the arteriole which is going towards the glomerulus. So, we will call that as the efferent arteriole. Okay, I hope that's clear. Efferent means that it is going towards it. This is going towards the glomerulus. It is an efferent arteriole. When we study the nervous system, you will see that there are efferent nerves. Afferent nerves means a nerve which will go towards the brain, okay? Now, after the afferent arteriole, the whole club, that whole bunch of capillaries that is there, we, were, we are going to be calling that as the glomerulus, okay? So, afferent arteriole is going to be leading to the glomerulus. Then, after the glomerulus coming out, again, just remember, it is all still oxygenated blood. What has happened at the level of the glomerulus? Remember the main function of the kidney. What is the main function of kidney? Isn't it filtration of blood? So at the level of glomerulus, that filtration of blood is going to be occurring. Okay, so here there is filtration of blood. All right, at the level of the glomerulus. Then after that blood is filtered out, obviously blood has to continue ahead. So the blood continuing ahead that I'm showing over here in this arrow, that again is going to form an arteriole but this time the arteriole is coming out of the glomerulus so now if it was going towards glomerulus it was called as efferent arteriole coming out of the glomerulus we will now give it the name of efferent arteriole all right so i hope these two terminologies are clear afferent and efferent afferent means going towards that body part and efferent means coming away from that body part so this part over here, okay, especially this part over here is known as the efferent arteriole. So artery divided into arterioles. Now, this efferent arteriole ahead is going to go 
and supply means it is going to also provide oxygen to other parts of the nephron too and all that other part are going to be thinner than the arterioles thinner than the arterioles i'll call them as capillaries okay but the remaining whole network that you're seeing this whole network that you're seeing you can see that these are a whole network of blood vessels which are surrounding the tubules and because they are surrounding the tubules they are found all around the tubules okay a word in zoology which stands for all around is called as peri what is it called as it's called as peri and these are vessels which are all around the tubules so we will give it the name as peri tubular capillaries okay so these are peritubular capillaries and can you see how they are formed all around the tubules okay now i want you to now concentrate only on the peritubular capillaries which are around the loop of henle remember the loop of henle that is this part over here only those peritubular capillaries around loop of henle those are going to give, be given a specific name and they're going to be called as the vasa recta again remember these vasa recta are capillaries only but these are the capillaries found around the loop of henle all right then can you see how at the level of the cap of the vasa recta you can see that there is the exchange of uh, materials taking place that's how you can see that over here all the oxygenated blood would be supplied and from here the deoxygenated blood will be taken in okay so that's what we see here can you see how now all those deoxygenated blood carrying cap capillaries are going to unite together and when they unite together they're going to be forming a blood vessel which we are going to be calling as a a venule all right so the capillaries are going to unite and they will form venule venules again unite and what will the venule give rise to what structure is this over here if this was renal artery then this one will be called as the renal vein all right so this is the whole blood supply let's just see that whole structure once again maybe in an easier way okay so first and foremost where does the blood come out of doesn't that blood come out of the heart so from the heart the oxygenated blood which blood are we talking about we're talking about oxygenated oxygenated blood okay oxygenated blood comes out of the heart and how does it come out of the heart with the help of the largest blood vessel and that largest blood vessel is called as the aorta okay so oxygenated blood enters into aorta aorta will go towards the kidney and as the kidney comes the aorta will start to divide remember the arteries always divide so aorta divides and it is going to be forming a artery okay the artery ultimately is going to be going ahead and forming arterioles arterioles go ahead and they form the capillaries capillaries are then uniting they're going to unite to form venules venules ahead unite they're going to be forming veins and veins come together and just like how you have the aorta as the largest artery similarly you also have a largest vein and the largest vein is going to be called as the vena cava either you have a superior vena cava or you also have an inferior vena cava okay so basically this is how for any organ the blood supply is now let us see over here how is it holding true for the kidney okay now first of all understand that when we're talking about the kidney we are going to be using the terminology of renal okay renal is the word that we're going to be using so for the kidney you would have the renal artery and you would have the renal vein okay now so oxygenated blood comes out of the heart enters into aorta from aorta enters into renal artery and now from the renal artery do you remember the name of that arteriole first arteriole i told you it was called as the efferent arteriole the one that was going towards the glomerulus efferent arteriole goes ahead and it forms capillaries which are those capillaries the glomerulus only okay so that those capillaries there this over here is the glomerulus okay then after the filtration happens at the level of glomerulus what comes out the efferent arteriole 
efferent arterial go ahead and they are going to wrap the tubules. Wrapping the tubules, may I call those as peritubular capillaries, okay. Then peritubular capillaries which are found around the loop of Henle. Those were given a name and that was called as vasa recta, okay. So vasa recta was found only near the uh, loop of Henle. Then from vasa recta, the capillaries will unite and they will form venules. Venules come together to form vein. Vein goes to inferior vena cava and then ultimately it will reach back to the heart. Did you understand this whole sequence of the blood supply of the kidney? Yes. So the main part, this region that you're seeing here, okay, this is the part of the nephron. Okay. And this whole thing, this whole chain that you have seen is nothing but you can call it as the renal blood supply. Okay. Let me just put this down back here. This was glomerulus. Okay. And over here was the vasa recta. So what you can do is I'll just disappear for a second and you can take a screenshot of this. So you have the renal blood supply with you. Okay. From heart and back to the heart arteries as well as the veins. Okay. So I hope you took your screenshots and shall we continue. Okay. Now talking about uh, what exactly the nephron is made up of. Now in our last lecture, we learned what exactly are the parts of the nephron. Today we will be going a little in deeper and we will understand that what exactly is the inner lining of the nephron made up of. Means if I am saying that this is a part of the nephron, remember this part of the nephron it was called as the PCT. PCT stood for proximal convoluted tubule. So can you see how inside there are these cells here, okay? So now we want to know that at different levels of the nephron, which are those cells present? And if they are present, then why, what, why is that particular cell present for? Naturally, it will have some function happening there, okay? So first of all, first and foremost, remember that our nephron was made up of two parts. First part was the Malphigian body. Second part was the renal tubule, all right? So we're going to begin with the histology what are we beginning with we're going to be learning the tissues involved so this is called as the histology okay what is histology histology means study of tissue so we're learning about the histology of the nephron okay histology of nephron now nephron uh, in the in the first malphigian body it's made up of two parts the first part being the bowman's capsule and the second part being those capillaries which we call as the glomerulus, okay. Let us begin with the Bowman's capsule. This Bowman's capsule, okay, it is like a cap. So it is a cup-shaped structure and it has two layers to it. So in those two layers, this here that you are seeing, can you see these small, small flat cells over here? This is the outer layer and there is going to be an inner layer too, okay. Inner layer, I'll teach you in a couple of seconds. Let's just first see what the outer layer is all about. This outer layer that we're seeing, okay, it is a double wall structure. Outer layer is going to be called as the parietal layer. Always, whenever you have two layers, out of which one is outer and one is inner, the outer layer is always called as the parietal layer. And over here, it's made up of flat cells. And those flat cells are called as squamous cells because squamous means scales okay and scales are basically flat so these are all squamous epithelial cells very flat cells but now you'll ask me that ma'am this over here is the glomerulus we're not able to see the inner layer of Bowman's capsule well that's because the inner layer of the Bowman's capsule is actually wrapped upon on the glomerulus can you see how if it is a glomerulus now you know that glomerulus are made up of capillaries so that ideally should have been red in color shouldn't it this whole region of capillaries that you're seeing it should have been red in color but do you see that it has a wrapping around it although it's given blue over here but do you see that blue colored wrapping around it well that wrapping that you're seeing on the glomerulus that is nothing but the inner layer of the Bowman's capsule so outer layer of Bowman's capsule is the part that you're seeing over here and the inner layer of the Bowman's capsule is actually going to be wrapped upon the 
glomerulus okay inner layer of bowman's capsule is wrapped on the glomerulus now these are made up of very special cells okay which have feet like projections and because those cells are having feet like projections another scientific name we know for feet is called as podo so that's why the inner layer is made up of cells with feet like projections so the word site stands for cell the word podo stands for feet okay so a podo site is nothing but a cell which has feet like projections and that inner layer of the bowman's capsule is made up of these cells which are called as podocytes outer layers are always related to they're always called as parietal layers and inner layers are always called as visceral layers so even for other parts of the body we will see when there are two layers outer will be called as outer parietal inner will be called as inner visceral layer okay outer parietal layer is made up of which cells made up of squamous cells inner visceral layer is made up of which cells made up of podocytes okay so now let's just have a quick and a better look at how these podocytes these podocytes look like okay before we head on to that we see that there is a space between the outer layer and the inner layer that space between those two is the space where the blood will be filtered okay so you know that over here this is the glomerulus and these are all capillaries okay now do you know that capillaries have small small pores in them so this is the region where blood will be filtered you know kidney does the work of filtering blood so this is where that filtration is happening so basically the blood collecting here is going to become urine right because it will be having wastes in them so that space which is there over here where that blood will collect can be called as urinary space because ultimately it will become urine can be called as bowman space or can be called as capsular space okay so the space between the two layers is given a name between the outer and inner layer and it's called as bowman space capsular space or even urinary space okay now let's go ahead let's have a look at those podocytes okay look at the podocytes here okay um sorry they'll come ahead in a couple of uh, minutes we'll see how the podocytes look like okay before that let's go on and uh, let's see the glomerulus parts okay now when we see the glomerulus these are a tuft of 50 capillaries how many i told you that is all only 50 capillaries being put together okay how is this glomerulus formed isn't it formed by the efferent arteriole and it leaves as the efferent arteriole do you remember those terms efferent arteriole and efferent arteriole what do i call as the glomerulus only those capillaries okay so if i ask you what is the glomerulus made up of will you include these arterioles not at all glomerulus means we are talking only and only about those capillaries okay not the arterioles and how many capillaries 50 capillaries okay so it's formed by efferent arteriole it leaves as the efferent arteriole and can you see here that the efferent arteriole and the efferent arteriole can you see how one is thicker than the other which one is thicker the efferent arteriole is thicker if the efferent arteriole is thicker than efferent what is the significance of this understand this this is going to be very important when we do urine formation just imagine you're going to watch a movie okay now for entering into the movie there are five doors so the public can go inside and enter inside very easily and watch the movie but then once the movie is over for an exit there's only one door so what happens now don't you see a whole big uh, there's a there's a lot of crowd which has gathered near that exit door yes so can i say that there's a lot of gathering can i say that there is a lot of pressure that's going to be build up near that exit door yes because it's only one because it's less so similarly when blood enters here the the diameter can you see that the diameter is quite big so if the diameter is big a lot of blood can enter in but then blood is then filtered over here okay the filtration process happens does all the blood get filtered no only some of the blood gets filtered the rest of the blood will have to be passed out back into the circulation but then when that rest of the blood is being passed out 
the diameter here is less and when the diameter there is less naturally what will happen just like when you want to exit that theater door there's going to be first a pressure buildup so because this diameter of the efferent arteriole is less than the diameter of the efferent arteriole there's going to be a pressure there's going to be a pressure buildup where at the level of the glomerulus so at level of glomerulus there will be a pressure buildup because the diameter of the efferent arteriole is greater than the diameter of the efferent arteriole this is extremely extremely important for the concept of urine formation okay diameter of efferent arteriole is greater than diameter of efferent arteriole okay what does this result in this is going to result in increased pressure okay where is it increasing that pressure at the at the glomerulus okay at the level of glomerulus the pressure is going to increase because of this all right after the glomerulus we move on to the next part of the nephron and that is the renal tubule do you remember the renal tubule had three parts yes which were those three parts do you remember that write it in the chat box really quickly let me see if you remember that renal tubule the three parts let me see if you remember them one two three i just want short forms tell me the short forms of the parts of the renal tubule the first part wasn't it called as the tell me wasn't it called as the pct yes what was the second part called as i'm not seeing any interaction what was the second part called as it was called as the loop of henle okay and this will this should help you understand what was the third part the third part was called as the dct remember those three parts of the renal tubule the pct the loop of henle and the dct all right so now let us see that what are these tubules internally lined with okay so here it comes the renal tubule okay first and foremost when we talk about the pct the proximal convoluted tubule it is located in the cortex remember that this line over here is going to demarcate all the structures above it lying in the cortex all the structures below it lying in the medulla okay so the renal uh, tubule the pct is lying in the level of the cortex pdc pct means we're talking about this part over here it is found in the cortex it is highly coiled and what is it made up of internally internally it is made up of uh, cuboidal epithelium cuboidal epithelium means that these here they are these are those cube shaped cells okay these are those cube shaped cells and those cube shaped cells are having the microvilli not only mito microvilli they are also having mitochondria so basically they are cells okay here is a here is a basement membrane then there are cells here cube shaped cells okay and those cube shaped cells are going to be having microvilli on them okay why is this happening these microvilli that's present there are going to be helping in absorption okay they'll be helping in absorption increasing the surface area so more and more absorption will happen and also mitochondria is present here for energy okay so in the pct we have cuboidal epithelium with a lot of microvilli and a lot of mitochondria okay next when we talk about the next part of the renal tubule let's go ahead with the loop of henle now in the loop of henle i'd like you to notice that there are two parts to this okay only talk about loop of henle first understand it is found in the medulla second can you see how there are two parts to it one is the thick part the thicker segment over here also and over here also do you remember that the loop of henle had uh, three parts to it the filtrate here is flowing downwards so this here was called as the descending limb okay limb this here was called as the hairpin bend and this over here was called as the ascending limb all right 
So this loop of Henle also has three parts to it. Also, the thickness is also varying. Over here, it is thicker. Okay, let me do it with a different colored pen. Over here, you can see it is thicker. Over here, it is thinner. So you have here that this is called as the thick segment, whereas this one over here will be called as the thin segment. Okay, so in these parts, in these three parts that we're seeing, the descending limb, the ascending limb, and the hairpin bend, the cells are also different. Wherever you have the thick segments, over there, there will be cuboidal cells, okay? And wherever you have the thinner segments, over there, you will find squamous cells, okay? Remember, cuboidal cells are going to be the cube-shaped cells with nucleus in the center. And the squamous cells will be all flat cells, okay? Very flat and very thin cells, all right? Now, what's the difference here? I'll tell you that. When we talk about cuboidal cells, the main function is always going to be absorption, okay? But when we talk about the squamous cells, the main function will always be diffusion, okay? Diffusion means allowing one substance to pass from one region to another area, okay, without energy. So, in this loop of Henle also, there are those different parts. These are squamous cells. These are going to be cuboidal cells, okay? Now, after the loop of Henle, the next part would be the DCT. Remember the DCT, distal convoluted tubule. I told you that PCT, P for pass, P for proximal. DCT, D for dur, D for distal, okay? The one that is near is the proximal one. The one that is far is the distal one, all right? So now let's continue with the distal convoluted tubule. Again, you can see because of this line over here, it is found to be in the cortex region. It is going to open at the last part and that last part over here is called as the collecting tubule. And what is the DCT internally lined with? Here also, just like the PCT, even the DCT is lined with cuboidal epithelium. The difference here is that it has less of microvilli and less of mitochondria. Now, why is that? We will see when we do urine formation, okay? So, this is all cuboidal epithelium, just that there is less mitochondria, less microvilli, okay? So, coming next, when we talk about the collecting tubule, which is a collecting tubule, not only this one here, even this would be a collecting tubule, even this would be a collecting tubule, yes? So all of these are collecting tubules. They are found in the cortex region. It is the last part of the DCT and the collecting tubules all together, maybe there are around five or six of them or six or seven of them. Six to seven of the collecting tubules come together. They unite together. And what is forming here, this here is called as the collecting duct. What is it called as? It's called as the collecting duct, okay? So that is the collecting duct and do you remember the urine flow that we had done in our last lectures? Yes, collecting ducts open into ducts which are called as the papillary ducts. Remember that? Papillary ducts or you can call them as ducts of Bellini. Okay, papillary ducts or ducts of Bellini. Okay, all right. Remember this structure? Yes, do you remember how this was called as the cortex? This was the medulla. These were the pyramids, right? And this was the apex region, the papilla. Then the minor calyx, the major calyx. This was known as the renal pelvis. And renal pelvis opened into the ureter. Remember this whole diagram? Okay, now let's see ahead. So these were those ducts of Bellini that we had seen. Okay, all right. Now we begin with the very important part of this whole session and that is of urine formation. So we're going to be studying the physiology of urine formation. Now you'll ask me what is physiology? Physiology basically means functions. Okay, they're going, you're going to be learning two words ahead when we go, when you enter into the medical studies, you have two words basically. The first word is called as anatomy. Okay, you understand the difference between these two words. The first word you learn is called as anatomy, okay? And the second word you learn is called as physiology. All right, now, if I tell you that the stomach is a J-shaped organ, 
okay it is uh, it is located in the abdomen if i tell you it is um, having three parts to it then how have i explained this haven't i explained you the structure of the stomach so whenever we're doing a structural study it is called as anatomy but then when i tell you that the stomach is going to be secreting hcl the stomach is going to be uh, doing the work of digesting digestion of proteins stomach is going to be secreting other enzymes gastric juice mucus everything this is all the work that the stomach is doing so when i'm saying that these are the functions of the stomach when i talk about functions it's known as physiology so basically the word anatomy means when we're talking about the structural structural study okay and when we talk about the word physiology it basically means functional study all right so you have anatomy and you have physiology what are we doing right now physiology of urine formation so we're going to be seeing what all are the functions that this nephron is going to be performing in order to ultimately form urine okay so shall we begin okay first of all we see one thing that urine formation happens or occurs at the level of the nephron and it takes place in three steps okay a total amount a total number of three steps come together to form urine which are those three steps you need to know those names by heart the first step is called as the step of ultrafiltration okay first is called as ultrafiltration second stage is called as selective reabsorption okay reabsorption why is it reabsorption we will see that later first ultrafiltration second selective reabsorption and third is going to be tubular secretion okay so just remember first these three names the first name is ultrafiltration second is called as selective reabsorption and the third is going to be called as tubular secretion okay now when we talk about the first stage that is ultrafiltration first understand why is it called as ultrafiltration whenever we see whenever we talk about filtration here at the level of the nephron it is all filtration happening under pressure do you remember why that pressure was there any any idea any anything you recollect from today's lecture only that why is there a pressure that's build up remember one thing that the diameters were different do you remember that the diameter of the afferent arteriole was greater than the diameter of the efferent arteriole this is what's going to be leading a pressure build up okay a pressure build up at the glomerulus okay so at the level of glomerulus there is a pressure build up because of the diameter difference over here in this diagram just to understand it okay this that you see in here okay this whole thing this is the glomerulus this over here is the afferent arteriole this over here is the efferent arteriole okay and which one is greater the afferent arteriole is going to be greater than the efferent that's why there is a whole pressure build up at the glomerulus okay now those yellow colored cells that you're seeing over there okay these are all the podocytes we'll see what those look like so filtration happening under pressure that's why we're going to be calling it as ultrafiltration okay now what exactly are the factors which are helping the ultrafiltration let's see that the first and foremost you already know that because the diameter is different because the diameter of afferent is greater than that of efferent this is one reason for the pressure build up all right also we see what else happens what else helps in ultrafiltration you know that the glomerulus is made up of capillaries right well these capillaries which are found in the glomerulus have so many pores inside them can you see this these capillaries here can you see all these pores inside here okay so all of these pores are going to enable more and more and more filtration to happen so that's why there is more filtration happening ultra filtration also we see that where we talked about those podocytes okay feet like projections there are slight gaps between them okay can you see how these gaps are present 
okay so there are slight gaps between them and those gaps are also going to allow substances to pass through so the gaps which are found between the podocytes are called as filtration slits which are allowing uh, the blood to pass through filter through so when we talk about the factors look at this here can you see this diagram this here the red colored blood vessel that you're seeing is the glomerulus okay the capillaries of glomerulus and those yellow cells that you're seeing can you see how those yellow cells are having those projections and they are looking like small feet like projections those cells exactly they are called as podocytes okay so those podocytes are basically the inner layer of the bowman's capsule and they are wrapped around that glomerulus okay so can you see how the podocytes have those layers between them can you see how they have these finger like projections here finger like okay and there is a gap between them those gaps that are present are called as the filtration slits okay so these gaps which are present between the podocyte cells they are called as filtration slits and through those filtration slits we will see that there will be blood being filtered out okay all right so basically there were three factors which were helping in ultrafiltration which were they the three factors helping in ultra filtration okay the first factor was that the diameter of afferent arterial is greater than the diameter of efferent arterial second factor the capillaries of glomerulus have pores in them okay those pores are given a special name and that name of the pores it's called as fenestrations okay that's going to be helping in filtration and third in the podocytes okay there are uh, slits in between which allows blood to filter so those are called as filtration slits in podocytes okay filtration slits present in podocytes these are the three factors which allow filtration to happen now let's come ahead okay when we talk about ultrafiltration, let us see what exactly filtration pressure is. Today, we're just going to study what this pressure is. How is this pressure being used? We will do this in the next session. So stay with me right now. Last two, three minutes, understand what these pressures are. Once you understand what these pressures are, next lecture when we study the actual pressures, it will become a piece of cake. Okay. So shall we start this? Yes. Let us understand what exactly is filtration pressure okay pay attention very important concept right now so here is a solution okay let's say we're talking about that this solution is nothing but blood so do you know that blood basically is a solution which can be called as a colloid yes what is a colloid colloid is a solution where there will be solutes present but those solutes will not be dissolved in the solvent. They'll be present. It will look like it is one solution only. It looks all homogeneous. But are the solutes dissolved? Not at all. So here we're going to be having one part of the solution which remains a liquid. One part of the solution which will remain to be solid. Okay. So when we talk about this here, can you see here the liquid part? And these red molecules that you're seeing is the solid part. Okay. So this is the solvent. And these are the solute. All right. So we always see that when we are talking about a colloid. Okay. There is always going to be a force exerted. By what? There is a force exerted by the liquid molecules. Okay. So the liquid, the solvent is going to be putting a force on the solid molecules so force exerted by liquid molecules on solid molecules is going to be called as a particular type of pressure which we will call as the hydrostatic pressure 
why are the liquid putting a force on the solid because the liquid wants to throw that solid particle out so the force exerted by liquid molecules on solid molecules why to throw them out of the solution that kind of force is going to be called as the hydrostatic pressure but do those solid particles fall out of the solution absolutely not they do not fall out of the solution so what do we see here this means that even those solid particles are going to be exerting a force on the liquid molecules so force exerted by solid molecules on the liquid molecules why do they put that force because they don't want to come out of the solution so because they want to stay in the solution that force is going to be called as the colloid osmotic pressure so we learned two pressures over here okay one pressure the first pressure liquid is putting on solid in order to throw that solid out of the solution and that is going to be called as hydrostatic pressure second is when the solid is putting a force on the liquid and why is it doing that so that it can stay in that solution that is going to be called as the colloid osmotic pressure so you have two pressures here one is a hydrostatic pressure and second is a osmotic pressure liquid on solid hydrostatic pressure solid on liquid osmotic pressure so we have to remember two pressures here okay when when we're talking about a colloid in a colloid there are two different pressures okay why am i teaching you all this you will understand when we when we do about uh, the ultra filtration process when we do it in the next lecture you will remember this okay so first the two pressures first pressure liquid on solid okay what was this called as this was called as hydro static pressure and second pressure that we saw it was the solid putting a force on the liquid to stay in the solution and that is called as osmotic pressure okay and these are the two pressures which we are going to be dealing with when we do in our next lecture all about ultra filtration so today's lecture what did we study we studied about the histology of the nephron what was histology study of the tissues okay did you understand today's lecture i really hope you did now if you remember today's lecture next lecture will become much easier although we will rewind we will revise it okay do one thing go ahead go back and uh, whenever you see this lecture uploaded you can just take screenshots and uh, take notes of it make notes of it because your information is something that's going to be extremely important even in the years to come okay so uh, if you did enjoy today's lecture do give a like on this video and uh, i would hope you would uh, share some comments also i hope you've subscribed already to our channel and hit the bell icon so that whenever my lecture does come up you guys would get a notification for the same all right so until our next lecture which is day after tomorrow hope i see you then uh, at that time so we can continue this session you guys stay home stay home and stay safe